Joining me today for our segment on For the Love of Italy is Diane Hales, international best-selling author and esteemed journalist, an unwavering aficionado and expert on the beautiful country which has inspired such works as La Bella Lingua, most recently La Passione, and Mona Lisa, A Life Discovered, the former of which saw Hales decorated with an honorary knighthood from the Italian president, more specifically, a Cavaliere dell'Ordine della Stella della Solidarietà. In addition to the well-received acclaim from her novels, Diane Hales has served as a contributing editor for publications such as American Health and Working Mother, among many others, Although one might imagine her in a beautiful cottage in Tuscany sourcing inspiration for her next novel, Diane lives in the San Francisco Bay Area and is the wife of Dr. Robert E. Hales, retired chair of psychiatry at the University of California, Davis, and mother to beloved daughter, Julia Hales. All in all, a rather sun-ripened and impressive picture, and one might agree that Italy is undoubtedly lucky to have her as an international patron. Grazie mille, Diane, and thank you for being with us this evening. Well, it's a pleasure and my honor. And one of the joys of discovering Italy has been for me discovering great people like Leonardo da Vinci. And so I am going to, uh, appropriately enough, because April 15th is his birthday. And I have, um, I just want to share my birthday thoughts on Leonardo da Vinci. <music> quintessential Renaissance man. Leonardo was born on April 15th, 1452, near the town of Vinci. Nothing about this artist and architect, musician and mathematician, scientist and sculptor, engineer and inventor, anatomist and author, geologist and botanist was ever ordinary. The illegitimate son of an unmarried country girl and a prosperous legal professional, Leonardo began an apprenticeship in Florence as a young teen. From an early age, he sketched, designed, painted, and sculpted like no one else. He looked like no one else, with carefully curled locks in his youth and a prophet's chest-long beard and age. He rode like a champion so strong that a biographer claimed that he could bend a horseshoe with his hands. I wish to create miracles, Leonardo wrote, but his creative designs were often so technically complex that he never could complete them. Despite some major works, he never carved a niche for himself in Lorenzo de Medici's Florence. In 1481, Lorenzo commissioned Leonardo to create a special gift, a silver lyre in the shape of a horse's head and deliver it to Francesco Sforza, the fierce warlord who ruled Milan. Leonardo was captivated by Milan, a prosperous big city of more than 80,000 residents that pulsed with energy and an invigorating spirit of intellectual innovation. Duke Sforza had attracted a rich medley of scholars, scientists, architects, poets, artists, and musicians. In their eyes, Leonardo possessed such an impressive wealth of talents that painting seemed just one. When Leonardo left Florence, his belongings did not include a single book. This quickly changed. Within a few months of his arrival in Milan, Leonardo recorded five books in his possession. 
Eventually, he would amass a library of more than 200 volumes, a substantial number even for any of the city's erudite scholars. Leonardo was insatiably inquisitive. Sir, Frank, Sir Kenneth Clark called him the most relentlessly curious man in history. In Milan, he plunged into a universe of new fields, anatomy, architecture, astronomy, geography, geology, mathematics, medicine, optics, natural history. But Leonardo soon ran into what seemed an insurmountable barrier, his lack of a formal education, particularly his limited knowledge of Latin, the language of science and scholarship. And so he embarked on what one historian describes as an obstinate attempt of cultural emancipation. He set out to learn what he needed to know in order to learn more. Now, Leonardo was juggling many other tasks at the same time that he was studying Latin, painting, teaching, making maps. He also was winning the admiration and appreciation of the Sforza court who shared his appreciation of physical beauty, stylish clothes, good manners, and fine horses. In time, Leonardo secured his dream appointment as court painter and engineer, a job that entailed everything from supervising shipping routes to tinkering with the hot water supply in royal residences. The art historian Vasari once commented that although without fortune, Leonardo always had servants and horses, which he loved dearly, as well as all sorts of animals. So immense was his affection for creatures great and small that Leonardo became a vegetarian, a rarity among the meat relishing people of his day. He was also said to buy caged birds solely to be able to set them free. For almost two full and fulfilling decades in Milan, Leonardo pursued his quest to penetrate the secrets of light, water, air, dreams, madness, even the nature and location of the soul. He calculated the ideal proportions for a human figure based on the geometry of the ancient architect Vitruvius. He dreamed of soaring like an eagle and drew plans for gravity-defying flying machines as well as for an armored tank and a submarine. In The Last Supper, Leonardo brought to painting such realism that Christ and his apostles seemed to breathe as they got gathered to dine together one last time. But while creating a work that has been hailed as the keystone of European art, Leonardo didn't use the standard alfresco technique for painting directly on fresh plaster. Instead, he experimented with different binding agents in an unusual white ground base. Within months, flecks of paint began to fall from the damp wall. In 1500, a French invasion of Milan forced Leonardo to flee to Florence. Over the next few feverish years, he would join the employ of the infamous Cesare Borgia as an engineer, spar with that upstart sculptor Michelangelo attempt unparalleled artistic feats and suffer ignominious failures. Through these years and beyond, Leonardo lavished time and attention on the one painting he would keep with him for the rest of his life. Italians call his portrait of Lisa Gherardini del Giocondo, La Gioconda, which can translate into the playful or laughing girl or it may merely be a variation on her husband's name of Giocondo. English speakers refer to this masterpiece simply as Mona, Madame Lisa. Once again, political upheavals forced Leonardo to flee. Around 1516, he settled in Rome at a time when he began to feel, as he put it, the bite of the hard teeth of the years. Some of his exceptional vigor deserted him. His right side seemed weak with a noticeable tremor in his hand. His vision, which had been troubling him for decades, deteriorated. At times he relied on spectacles or goggles of some sort, tinted blue. Yet Leonardo filled notebooks with big ideas, a machine to produce rope, 
another to coin money for the, for the Roman mint, along with apocalyptic images of great deluges. Still fascinated by the workings of the human body, Leonardo continues his anatomical study until they drew the Pope's ire, and he had to seek a new home. No place in Italy offered Leonardo refuge. No Italian patron sought his services. The French King Francis I, in contrast, showered him with affection and invited him to France. In 1516, at age 64, Leonardo embarked on the longest journey of his life, a three-month trek from Rome to Florence to Milan, across the Alps to Lyon, and finally to Amboise. Accompanying him were two devoted assistants and a train of mules toting his earthly possessions, the Mona Lisa among the crates of books, scientific instruments, clothes, and mirrors. Leonardo found a final safe harbor in a handsome manor adjacent to the French monarch's great chateau. In this serene setting, he continued to think, advise, dictate, and teach. Some of the last drawings of Leonardo's life, whimsical sketches of cats and dragons and fanciful animals, capture his enduring playfulness. He died there at age 67 on May 2nd, 1519. Unlike other artists who let their works speak for them, Leonardo left a rich legacy of words. Although he described himself as a uomo senza lettera, a man without letters, he took pride in his independent thinking and nimble mind. <clears throat> Why are we supposed to worship the sun? He once asked caustically, when all the churches are dedicated to his mother. He admired the human body as a marvel of nature, but disdained its owners as sacks of food and fillers up of privies. His eclectic written treatises include the memorably titled Why Dogs Gladly Sniff One Another's Bottom. The reason? The smell lets them know how well fed a dog is. A whiff of meat indicates a powerful and rich owner and a need for a doggy deference. Leonardo delighted in puns, complex codes, spoofs, and pictograms. Sketches, for instance, of the letter O and a drawing of a pear, pera in Italy, in Italian, to represent the word opera, the Italian for work. He also jotted jokes in his notebooks. In one, a painter is asked how he depicted such beautiful images of things and yet produced such ugly children. The punchline, he made his paintings by day and his children by night. In a riddle, Leonardo asked which men walk on treetops and which on the backs of great beasts. The answer, it depends on whether they are wearing wooden clogs or leather shoes. Leonardo's ongoing conversations with himself covered more than 5,000 surviving manuscript pages gathered into Libricini, combination sketch and notebooks, written in his idiosyncratic right to left mirror script. True to his mantra of saper vedere, to know how to see, Leonardo's incomparable volumes crackle with a lifetime of astute observations, set down without punctuation or accents. Dini, tell me, Leonardo would doodle when breaking in a new pen nib. In the margins of his notebook, another phrase appears. Tell me if anything was ever finished. This was written by an artist who left so many projects unfinished. The world's fascination with Leonardo has never faded. His name remains synonymous with genius. His Mona Lisa, the most recognized painting of all time. His works, the inspiration of generations of admirers. Why? Leonardo himself offers an explanation. Beauty in life perishes, he wrote in his journals, not in art. And so the beauty of Leonardo's works and of his brilliant mind lives on 478 years after his birth. Thank you for letting me share this story with you. Thank you.